Hello again, your friendly heavy physics teacher here. And this is my uh, lesson for my college physics class. Uh, unit 10, lesson three, simple harmonic motion in the presence of attenuating forces. And this is gonna be basically a terminology lesson. Um, we're not gonna really be doing calculations for this, uh, um, but you do need to understand how physical simple harmonic motion is affected by forces that are non-conservative, friction, things like that, okay? Outside forces maybe that are applied to the system, okay? So here we go. All righty. Under ideal conditions, if we have a uh, simple harmonic motion that is only happening uh, under the influence of a conservative force or multiple conservative forces, say in the, the ideal situation of a super bouncy ball, you drop it and uh, there's no frictional losses, it'll come back up to your hand going doink, 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 doink up and down. Okay, this would be. Uh, a graph of the linear displacement with time that that ideal simple harmonic motion would experience, okay? You start off at a certain distance away from your starting point. The conservative forces act and it moves. If it's a mass on a spring, it's going to be vibrating back and forth, all right? So technically, you could look at it like this. All right, it's going back and forth and back and forth. And this would be a graph I'd pull up with time, all right? Um, this could be the vertical height instead of the, the horizontal distance. This could be vertical height, all right? And it falls, it falls down, okay? And uh, this goes below the equilibrium position, up above the equilibrium position, so on and so forth. Uh, if it were... If it were a ball, this, this graph might be a little more complex than that. But it's still, the thing we would notice is your amplitude over time would stay the same. And that's how you know it's ideal. If your amplitude is not changing over time, you know you're not losing any, any of the energy of the system. Okay? Now, what happens if we have friction in the system? Well... We all know that if you watch a pendulum for long enough, the amount of the, the time it takes to swing doesn't change. Now that's key. The time the, the swing takes doesn't change, but the distance that it swings decreases over time. That's what we mean by attenuation, okay? So attenuated, simple harmonic motion looks like this. Slowly over time, the amplitude decays, all right? And not only the amplitude in one direction, but the amplitude in both directions decay, all right? The amplitude it would have it were ideal with is the dashed line up here, but because it's experiencing some amount of friction, and this this graph represents a, a very small amount of friction, okay? Over time, it decays. And eventually, you'd get to a point over here where you'd barely notice it vibrating back and forth, all right? But it still might be vibrating, okay? And so this is what we mean by an attenuation, a decrease in amplitude over time because a non-conservative force is acting to, to cause the amplitude to change the energy from the motion energy of the vibration into another form of energy in the system, okay? So for a pendulum, that would be the physical energy of the pendulum moving air molecules out of the way, okay? It would be the heating of the, the, uh, the molecules that are at the attachment point as this wiggling vibration goes on at the attachment point at the top. For a spring, it would be the heating that's happening in the, the coils of the spring simply because the elastic nature is not ideal in a spring, okay? So we have all those things going on. I'm saying, okay, a lot, aren't I? 
Um, uh, we have all those things going on in the presence of non-conservative forces. Now, if the non-conservative force is very strong, this can happen in less than one cycle. You could get to a point where it just goes down to the equilibrium point. That's a shock absorber in a car. They are specifically designed to damp the vibration of the wheel as it goes either over a bump or into a chuck hole. All right. It's designed to make it have less than one uh, period. Less than one. That's called over damped. All right. Uh, this right here would be under damped. Um, uh, there's lots of different ways that this can be applied. Now, let's think about a kid on a swing. Okay? You take your younger brother or sister, you take your cousin, you take the, the kid you babysit out, uh, and you go to the swing if they let you go to swings these days. Uh, <laughs> can you tell I did this during the COVID 19 era? Um, uh, you go to a swing, you go to a playground, and you put the child on the swing, or you yourself sit in the swing, okay? And under normal circumstances, what would happen? Right, diddly squat, okay? You just sit there. Why? Because you're in equilibrium, okay? So if you happen to be sitting on the swing, you pull back, all right? You, you actually pull back physically, but believe it or not, it raises the swing just a little bit. So you swing forward. And then you kick your legs back. That's you adding energy. Plus, you release your pull on the, the thing, and that causes you to swing back. Then you pull. Ha ha. I'm pulling. I'm doing work on the chain that's holding the swing up. And I'm also lifting that slightly above where I came to in the back. And I kick my feet out. Zoop. I go forward. Zoop. I come back. And so that's how I get myself going. There are external forces causing the swing to start its motion. And then you stop. You stop swinging your feet. You stop pulling on the chain. And you'll swing. And over time, it gets you back to the starting point. That's the attenuation. Okay? So we can do something called force, forced oscillation. You swinging your legs, you pulling on the on the chain like that, that's forced oscillation. Let's say it's you've got your 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 sister, your person you're looking after for childcare, whatever, and you're gonna push them. Okay. So I, when my son was younger, the first thing I would do would be I'd pull him back and let him go. Okay. So by pulling him back, I'm adding energy to the system. Let go. Zoop, he goes out, he comes back, and he would never get quite back to where I started. So I lean in a little bit, and I push on him, okay? So I've added energy to the system. And so now maybe on the far side, his amplitude will be slightly higher, even though there's friction in the system. He comes back to me, I push him again. He comes back to me, I push him. Eventually, it gets to a height where... Um, I can't reach him anymore. But as long as I apply the force at the same time as he's at these maximum points, or if I were to stand in the middle and apply the force with the motion, I would add energy to the system or I would return energy to the system that had been lost from friction. That's a term we call being in phase, okay? And so in the class notes, I hope you saw um, the differentiation between in phase and out of phase. In phase, if you have forced oscillation, if you are adding an external force to overcome the attenuation, all right, you have to add it in phase. You have to add it as in the same direction as the motion, and at the same frequency of the motion, because if you try and do it out of phase, complications arise. So, in phase versus out of phase. Give me a moment. All right. In phase, if two 
things were moving with simple harmonic motion in phase, then they would both move together over time. The way to think about this is you've got two kids on the swing. Um, both of them have the same length for the swing. Their centers of mass are in the same location. So if you start them swinging together, they will end up always swinging together. It looks kind of interesting. Okay. On the other hand, if you have one kid start swinging, and then when, when that kid gets halfway through, the next kid starts swinging, then it would look like this. One would be out at a maximum when the other one's at the equilibrium point. All right. Or you could have it so that they are um, 180 degree. This, is, this represents a 90 degree out of phase or pi over two out of phase. Okay. You could have it so that it's um, pi over two. Yeah, pi over two out of phase. Um, you could have it so it's uh, 180 degrees out of phase. In other words, one person is starting at their maximum amplitude. The other person is over here at their maximum amplitude, but they're swinging like this. And that is 180 degrees out of phase. All right. So out of phase means that one is starting its motion and the next one starts its motion a little later in time or maybe starts it from a different position, which puts it out of time, out of phase with uh, the other vibration that's happening. Okay. So if we want to make sure that the, the swing um, goes back and forth, and maintains its amplitude in the presence of friction, I would have to add a force just enough to overcome any of the friction that's happening during the motion, okay? There are times where the motion of one thing can affect another thing nearby it. Uh, when I taught at LaSalle, there was an interesting phenomenon. Kids got nervous knee. And notice I'm creating this situation. You see how the picture stopped moving? That's an attenuation. Now I'm going to start the picture moving again, but I'm not going to touch. I'm not touching my computer. See, my hands are here. But notice. I was bouncing my leg, that bounced the floor, that bounced the table that this was on, and that caused that shaking of the picture that you see, okay? That's a form of resonance, all right? Uh, you, if you do it at just the right frequency, you can cause a sympathetic vibration to happen in something nearby, okay? How many people in band, for those of you who are instrumentalists, have been in band and the percussionists are back there doing whatever percussionists do while the rest of the band is playing something, uh, specifically tuning up and going through scales? I always, I played trombone, so this all, I was usually sat in front of the percussionist, okay? We'd be going through, bum, 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 bum. And then we hit that next note, bomb, and we hear bzzz come from the snare drum. But notice it didn't happen before that. And that's because whatever the length of the snare drum was just right to resonate with the vibration of the sound waves that we were making. Okay, so there we have a natural uh, translation of the energy from one point to another. And if they both have the same frequency, one has a natural frequency it vibrates at, the other one is then vibrating at that natural frequency, the two can create an in-phase wave so that they're both happening together. If the energy that's being input is high enough, if the force that's creating that resonance is strong enough, the thing that begins vibrating begins vibrating 
bigger and bigger and bigger, and then eventually it can get to a point where it would be, if it's a physical vibrating system, like a spring, like a swing, you would go beyond the physical dimensions of the spring being able to return. It would stretch out and stay stretched, or it would compress and tangle. Um, the the uh, very dramatic version of this is the idea that um, when you flick a wine glass, you hear that tone. If you can play that tone back, that frequency that you hear back loud enough, amplitude big enough, you can actually cause the wine glass to vibrate and shatter. Okay, Mythbusters did a demonstration of this principle, and there was a fella on it. They recorded it, and he was able to, with his voice, he was able to shatter a wine glass. Okay, um, the the idea that it has to be a high note that shatters it, mm -mm. loud note, and it has to be at the same natural frequency as what it is. Uh, in the notes, you'll see that I, I gave you that link to um, the uh, K5 News story way back when uh, from Tacoma, Washington, about the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse. Um, that is an example of the mechanical forces of the wind blowing across the, uh, the bridge, creating vortices around the bridge that cause high pressure and low pressure zones. That actually caused the bridge to start wobbling like this. And then that, take a piece of wire and you vibrate it long enough, you'll eventually break that piece of wire. Well, that's what happened to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in November of 1940. I encourage you to watch that. Um, uh, they quote, no quote, call it found video. Um, uh, that's the one I used to show my kids at, at uh, LaSalle before the eight millimeter tape that it was on broke. Um, it was from the University of Washington Engineering Department. Um, the tape I was using was from uh, like the 1950s. And yeah, it broke after so many uses of, uh, so many times of use. Um, but this video is, is really very interesting um, to watch. And this is what they mean by destructive resonance. The resonance that took place was the fact that the force of the wind blowing across the, uh, the structure was just the right speed to set up vortices that created a pressure difference, which created a sinusoidal uh, uh, change in how that pressure variance happened, demonstrated or it created SHM of the bridge wobbling side to side. It also started doing this. Uh, when you looked at the span between the stanchions, you could see it doing a little of this, but it was doing more of this. This torsional vibration is what broke it up. Okay? So, there you have it. Simple harmonic motion in the presence of attenuating forces. If you want to keep the motion happening, you have to do forced oscillation that is in phase with the motion. Because if it's out of phase, it's gonna dampen, all right? If it's in phase, it adds to it. So if the friction is taking away, you add enough back in so that you maintain the motion. That's what mechanical clocks do. All righty. This is your friendly heavy physics teacher signing off once again. Uh, thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see you soon.